I'm Nisha Nagarian. And I'm Doug Chessa. Family Heritage Stories exists to give you ideas and examples of stories from the past to help you shape the future. If those stories aren't passed down from generation to generation, they're lost and those people are forgotten. Everyone has a story. Stories have power. They help us understand each other. And these stories deserve to be passed down. It is time for Family Heritage Stories. We all benefit from heroes among us. Now they're gonna say, ah, it's just part of the job. But it's more than that. It's time for Hero Salute Stories. Hi guys, this is Doug Jessup. With me today, an American hero, Mara Naughton. Okay, and she she's gonna go, oh yeah, no, 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 no. Okay, but you actually retired from the United States Army as? A Lieutenant Colonel. Okay, now that's a big deal. So tell me where and when and what, all this fun stuff. So we're gonna, we're gonna dive deep. What in the world possessed you get in the military? So growing up, uh, my dad had been a World War II and Korean War vet. Mm -hmm and so was my uncle. And so I was inspired by that, that I wanted to go into the military. I had actually enlisted in the Navy while I was still in high school. And when I got a scholarship, they, I called them up and they tore up the paperwork. But a year into uh, college at Westminster College, I uh, went ahead and joined the ROTC group. And uh, at the end of, when I graduated, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant. Wow, okay, now um, I realize that there's some interesting little, uh, we'll, we'll call it rivalries, because I come from a military family as well. Between the different branches, what branch did your father serve in? He was in the Army as okay. well. Okay, and any of the other relatives, were they all Army or a little bit of everything? Uh, my uncle was in the Army. I have two brother-in-laws that were Air Force. Uh, and I think we have some Navy. A little bit, a little bit of this. Right. Okay, so aren't go, go Army, beat Navy type? Right. Okay, okay, just checking. Okay, and you're married to a veteran as well. Okay, now, um, actually, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit of that, that because you and I had an interesting similarity that I had no idea, and this is cool. So, uh, how did you meet your husband? Uh, I was on my second tour in Germany and they have a pretty good ski cl club in the Stuttgart area, mm -hmm. Patch Barrack ski, cl ski Club, and I was in charge of a trip and he signed up for my trip. And we got together then and kind of never looked back. We had a, <laughs> a, a separation when he left Germany to go to a civilian fellowship and I stayed and then I got shipped off to Desert Storm and his unit, because he stayed in the uh, reserves, was activated, but he never made it over to Saudi Arabia or Iraq. Um, but we got together when I came back from Germany mm -hmm. and we were stationed at Port that, That's the, Port yeah, Airport. I mean, we've got the wedding picture, okay. So tell me about your service uh, in Afghanistan and, and that area. So I was not in Afghanistan, I was in Saudi Arabia, Saudi, sorry. Okay. Kuwait, Iraq, um, just about everything except yeah. Afghanistan. <laughs> so the tour was about six months, mm -hmm. so it wasn't too awfully bad. And we ran the logistics base for the Seventh Corps. Oh, wow. So the Seventh Corps was uh, shipped out of Germany uh, with all their equipment uh, to Saudi Arabia. And uh, there wasn't, there was the 82nd. And there was one unit out of the Fifth Corps that was shipped, but that's how we fought that war, was shipping people from Germany that were already on the ground. The, uh, the wall had come down and things got exciting in the rest of the world. You know, it was a, a good time <laughs> to an be interesting way, yeah. stationed in Europe. It mm -hmm. was wonderful, but uh, the rest of the world kind of didn't have that, uh, that barrier 
yeah. to keep them in line. Yeah. Well, so. you know, you got to have somebody to always help with the policing, I guess. So where were you trained initially? Where'd you go to boot camp? So my, uh, my first boot camp was at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, because I had uh, enlisted in the Army Reserve. And when I came back, that's when I got into ROTC. So ROTC advanced camp was at Fort Lewis, Washington. And then when I was commissioned as a second lieutenant, I went to Fort Lee, Virginia, which it's not called Fort Lee anymore. We had a little bit of a mix up on all our names. Yeah, well, you know. Well, the other thing that I think people may not realize is, I mean, there's, there's a fair amount of women in the military now, but not so much back then. What was it like being a woman officer? So I really didn't take a lot of uh, garbage. So, I'm, <laughs> yeah. so I was okay. Um, there was advancements and there was barriers. Uh -huh. And you just had to balance that. And I, I uh, had a career that I would not trade for anything. You know, I don't want to go back, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad I did it. So, Well, with another entry into Family Heritage Stories <laughs> and Mara, I'm Doug Jessup. We'll be right back. Hero Salute Stories are made possible by the generous support of viewers like you. Go to fedorafoundation.org to donate today. I'm General Max Stitzer. I want to share with you the great honor that I've had to be associated with Doug Jessup, the Fedora Foundation, and Family Heritage Stories. It is so vital and essential that we remember, that we preserve, and that we teach our heritage and history. This program and the work that Doug and Fedora Foundation do is so vitally essential to remembering the heroes of this nation. They come in many forms. Some serve in uniform, and all across the different career fields and pursuits in life, we're surrounded by heroes. Well, one day, their time on this earth will pass. They must always be remembered and thanked for what they've done to give us the way of life that we have, to preserve what matters to us as a nation, as a people, as communities. It is so vital that we recognize and remember greatness and service and those who have served. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesty above. You know, there's a special bond between grandparents and grandkids. Tell me a story about your grandma or grandpa. Okay, now let's pick a grandpa. So my grandfather's name is on my father's side, paternal side. That, that was my mother's side. 
His name was Thomas Edward Kimber, and he is a immigrant son, also from the Utah Pioneers. They came from England and came across the plains by mule train. And then they went to Tooele here in Utah. And then they went to a little town called Grouse Creek, Utah. It's up on the Utah-Idaho border, middle of Nevada. And he and his brothers lived on a farm. And during World War I, they were farmers, and so they weren't drafted into World War I. But later on, during the end of the war, he was. And there were a lot of people in our town by the name of Kimber, and he had a lot of cousins there, so they called him Tommy Ted. His name was Thomas Edwards, so Tommy Ted was his nickname. And he joined, the, joined into World War I with his brother and went up to Spokane, Washington to train, then down to San Diego to train. And they made him a cook because they didn't know that he was from the outdoors and he could shoot really well. Very good shot. And so he had to do a shooting test and they found out that he could shoot very well. Well, his cooking days were o'er and he became a scout. So when he went to France, he was one of the men who um, Le Ferve, France, he was one of the men who rescued the lost battalion. He was a scout there and he's one of our heroes and, and he loved my grandmother and sent gifts and that sort of thing to his mother and grandparents when they were back in Grouse Creek, the little town. But there was a man who gave him a special blessing called a patriarchal blessing, said that if he would do what he should and, and be more moral, that he would come back alive. And him and all the men that they gave patriarchal blessings to, they came back alive. And um, they had a big, huge celebration at the town. And we have a picture of that, the old sandstone church and all the veterans standing on the steps. So it was pretty neat and we're really proud of him. And then he went on to raise his family and to, and to live to be about 85 years old, so. Broadcasting from Lanny Bernard Gallery, you're watching Family Heritage Stories. We'll be right back. Everyone has a story. Stories have power. They help us understand each other. If you want help saving your Family Heritage Stories with a private interview, contact Krista at FedoraFoundation.org for pricing and availability. Austin Warwood, I was going to tell you a joke about time travel. You didn't like it. Oh. <laughs> a little later in the show, we find out the story behind one of the treasures remembered here at Anthony's Fine Art and Antiques. Did you know that you could get help saving your family heritage stories with a private interview with me or Doug? Contact Krista at FedoraFoundation.org to schedule your interview. Everybody comes from somewhere. What does heritage mean to you? Ooh, my favorite thing about Peru is probably the food. <laughs> so the food, I love Peruvian food. I'm obsessed. I live by it. And I love the diversity that we have in our, in our weather, like every, we have all the weathers you can imagine. We have the jungle, mountains, beach. It's just so diverse that also the, the diversity of, of the climates in Peru are correlated with the diversity of the food because we have all kinds of foods. What's some of your, okay, describe your favorite, one of your favorite uh, Peruvian food dishes. Well, definitely ceviche is my number one. Every time I go back to Peru, all I want to eat is ceviche. Um, why? I don't know. I think the food and emotion, it's connected. So when I eat ceviche, I think about my childhood. I think about the beach, which is one of my favorite places to be. I think about the summer. I think about eating in front of the beach. That's 
that's what ceviche means for me. Okay, for people that don't know, do you have, for lack of a better term, a recipe for ceviche? So a little, like I've never made it myself because in Peru, you just get it. Yeah. <laughs> you just get it at the store, I mean, at the corner shop or at a market or a restaurant. I've seen people do it and the way how they do it is they cut raw fish and they make the sauce with lime, ginger, different types of chilies, salt, um, celery. They blend the whole thing with a little bit of raw fish as well. And that sauce is called leche de tigre, which translates for tiger's milk. I don't know why they put that name. <laughs> and then you put that sauce on the raw fish with onions, sweet potato, corn. And it's just an experience of flavor, like the citrus, fish, sweet potato. You gotta get a full fork off all of those. Hi, my name's Tanner Gilman from television and you're watching Family Heritage Stories. We'll be right back. Maybe in, in a situation or two, those kids or grandkids may learn something that has uh, touched me. I'd like to have them remember me uh, and I'd like to have them learn a little bit from me. They need to live their own lives. But if I can, if I can give them some ideas that may make their life a little bit better, I'm happy to do that. I'd be happy to recommend this to other people. I think that sharing stories of yourself, the reality of who you are, and having people being able to remember you uh, is a big deal. And we all have different stories. And most of them are re pr really pretty interesting. Everyone has a story. Stories have power. They help us understand each other. If you want help saving your family heritage stories with a private interview, contact Krista at FedoraFoundation.org for pricing and availability. You learn a lot about traditions, values, and culture when you travel. It's time for Vacation Locations. What part of I'm busy don't you understand? Excuse me, an urgent package has arrived. Urgent? Who is it from? You, from 20 years ago. Thank you. What? Surprised? You probably don't even remember. If you're watching this, it means that 20 years have passed. I'm hoping our hairline isn't receding and that we don't have a large gut. As I know you, or rather, as I know myself, we may have forgotten quite a few things we learned during this summer. So, I've decided to record this video to remind you of them. Remember the time when we were travelers, not tourists? When we were drawn by curiosity, not by a book. When we didn't need to make plans to have a good night. You remember. If you're happy, turn this video off. Ah, I see you're still there. <laughs> the future. Did we marry her? No. Did you take my earring off? <laughs> well, after all, you are old enough. Remember, we always had time to make friends. <laughs> and to learn. To learn that there was a time when the whole world said it can't be done. And the hopes of a country demonstrated that the world was wrong. And above all, remember that life is a succession of events and that it all depends on how we live them.
wherever you are in 20 years' time, or rather, wherever we are in 20 years' time. Remember when we came to Peru. Darling. You'll be home late, won't you? Have you ever been to Peru? Whatever you need is now in Peru. Soy Mariana, estás viendo Historias de Herencia Familiar. Ya regresamos. Pass it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Objects with stories are treasures remembered. It's time now for a visit with Dr. Micah Christensen. I'm here with Micah Christensen from Anthony's Fine Art. And so, number one, thanks for letting us see all this cool stuff here. We've got a special painting behind here. So tell me a little bit about it. So this is a painting whose subject most people will recognize if you're one from one of the major world religions. Yeah. This is the flight into Egypt. You have Mary, you have the Christ child, and you have Joseph, who have just fled Bethlehem in order to avoid being killed by Herod's uh, uh, troops. The artist who did this is Edouard Jérôme Paul Pignon. He was a French artist. He painted this in 1892, where it showed in the Paris Salon of 1892. Okay, now that's a big deal. Now, it is a huge deal. It's something that it's hard for us to comprehend today. And the number of people who went to Paris to see the Paris Salon where this showed was roughly 2.8 to 3 million people. Wow. So twice the population. This is at a time when there weren't really movies or radio or television. The mass entertainment of that time was painting, was sculpture, were these major exhibitions. And the exhibition had echoes abroad where this painting, it was one of 2,000 paintings shown in the exhibition, was then reproduced in multiple formats, in books, in postcards, in posters. It hung on people's walls. It had a life well beyond this artist and this work. So I noticed some geography and these mountains. Do they have any kind of significance? So this is the Jabal Altar mountain in Egypt. And that's a place today where if you were to look at it, on top of that hill is the Church of the Madonna. And it's to commemorate this moment in the, history, in the scriptures of the Coptic Egyptians, who are Christian Egyptians, and also of Muslims, the story of Christ coming to Egypt. So if you're an Egyptian Christian, the idea of Christ coming to Egypt, it's a big part of your, your heritage and your story. Now, I also noticed that the angels over here, they're obviously, they're not looking at them. They're, they're kind of in the side. But I also know they kind of have this mute, this pastel colors, almost like a mauve. That's right. Um, is there any significance in that? So the 1890s was the era of Art Nouveau. And this, this color becomes a fashion, this mauve color. And it plays right into the, um, the Romanovs, the Russian royal family, who is at this time redecorating the Alexander Palace in St. Petersburg. It's their main residence as the Russian royal family. And they're redecorating it in the style of Art Nouveau, much the horror of some people. Who are <laughs> and the, the most frequented room by the family, the one that's the most precious to them, is called the Mavra. Well, yeah, there you go. When they saw this painting in the Salon of 1892, it had already been sold to another collector. So they go to Edouard Jérôme Papignon and they ask him to make another painting of a similar subject, which is also flight into Egypt. And it hung over the, 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 the chair where they did their knitting, where they did their socializing in the Alexander Palace. Well, thank you so much for sharing these stories because the way I look at it, objects with stories, 
our treasures remembered. Everyone has a story. Sometimes those stories are told through music. Hello, I'm Eli Jenkins. This is the Second Chance Band. Uh, this is Give Said the Little Stream. gives there is something all can give do as the streams and blossoms do for god and others live singing sing makes you smile. Spry Natural Xylitol Mints make me smile. I think it might help you too. It's our honor to be able to help people remember where they came from. The Fedora Foundation supports the collection, preservation, and distribution of diverse stories of traditions, values, and culture, right here on TV and online as well at familyheritagestories.org. How do you want to be remembered? With another episode of Family Heritage Stories, I'm Nisha Degarin. And I'm Doug Jessup.